Welcome to Variable Valve Timing 101, sponsored by Cloys. In the next three modules, you're going to be learning about variable valve timing. First, you're going to learn how the system works, how the system can fail, and then how to diagnose and repair these systems. Joining us today is Cody Smith from Cloys. So, let's get started. Today, we're discussing how these phasers control the camshaft position in the engine. In today's module, it's sponsored by Cloys. And with me today is Cody Smith from Cloys. What do you do at Cloys? I'm the technical support manager. And today we're going to be discussing what happens with these and what you need to know to service the system. So, Cody, question for you. What do these do and what's the advantage for OEMs putting these on their engines now? Well, it's a way for automobile manufacturers to squeeze more horsepower and torque from an engine. So with a traditional camshaft, you're, you're limited with a fixed valve lift, duration, and timing. Uh, so it's always kind of a compromise between horsepower and fuel economy. So a variable valve timing system can change the timing of the camshaft by up to 30 degrees. Uh, it's like having multiple camshafts all in one camshaft. Wow, I did not know that. So this is the heart of the system, the camshaft phaser. How does this work on the vehicle? A camshaft phaser primarily works off the oil pressure. So at rest, uh, the camshaft phasers have a locking pin that, that locks the rotor and stator together, and it really just works as a solid sprocket. Uh, but once the phaser receives some oil pressure, that locking pin is gonna unlock, and it's gonna allow the rotor to move inside the stator and adjust the timing of the camshaft itself. Uh, so the, the phaser has two main parts, like I just said, it has a rotor and a stator. The stator is connected to the timing chain uh, and the rotor, which is going to be connected to the camshaft itself. Uh, the two components together uh, form oil chambers uh, that allow the adjustable range of motion. Um, the chambers are charged and discharged utilizing oil ports fed by the oil control valves. I guess the next component is how does this oil control valve control this camshaft phaser? So the oil control valve, uh, or we actually call them solenoids, they adjust the, the position of the phasers using a, a pulse width modulation from the engine's computer. So that phase, or that solenoid has always got oil pressure going to it, uh, and depending on that pulse width from the engine's computer is going to control which ports the oil flow is going to move to and that results in the phaser either advancing or retarding the camshaft phaser depending on which side the solenoid is, is supplying the oil pressure to. So one side could be seeing 30 psi, the other side could be seeing 60 psi, but in a duty cycle and that controls the position how many degrees forward or advance? Exactly, exactly. It's not going to be completely advanced or completely retard. A lot of times it's going to be floating in, in a position where, wherever the computer you know feels like the optimum fuel economy and, and performance is going to happen at that RPM range. At what pressure does that lock pin come out and uh, allow the phaser to move? It, it probably depends more on, on application, and I'm sure that varies. Um, in, in our testing, we found that, that typically you know, 15 to 20 PSI is about uh, the, the minimum nece necessary pressure to get that locking pin to unlock. And when that locking pin's not working, what does it sound like? If the locking pin's not working and it is engaged, it's, it's, you're not going to get a sound. Uh, it's going to act just as a solid camshaft sprocket. Um, of course, it's going to trigger some, some codes because the, the computer isn't seeing the adjustment like it, it's expecting. Um, but if the locking pin is somehow unlocked, uh, you, you very well could have a, a rattle at startup uh, because the, the rotor and stator are, are moving. Um, and it doesn't have the oil pressure, you know, at, at a cold start to keep it in a stable condition. I guess another question, since we have the different styles of phasers here, um, an engine can have it both on the intake and exhaust camshaft. Mm -hmm. Is there anything different arrangement-wise? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there, there's a wide variety of arrangements. Some, some engines, uh, like pushrod engines, uh, are using one phaser. Uh, there's applications that are, are dual overhead cam that have two phasers, one for each head. Uh, but there's also applications that may be a dual overhead cam, uh, but have phasers on all four camshafts. So that, that varies uh, greatly depending on the application. And another question that just came up to me, thinking about the theoretical part of this, how does the oil from the pump get to the solenoid? 
and then to the phaser. It just runs through, uh, you know, journals inside the engine. Um, so it's, it's getting a constant oil supply from the oil pump, uh, just as any, you know, camshaft bearing or, or any kind of engine bearing would. Um, and of course it's traveling through the, the inlet screens of the solenoid, uh, and being controlled and then through the ports, uh, to get to the, to the phasers. Now the ports going to the phasers, a lot of time that's going to happen through the camshaft itself. Um, so it is important that the engines are in good shape, uh, that, that, you know, uh, camshaft bearings uh, don't have too much wear because you could experience some cross flow um, and, you know, poor phaser performance as a result. Sounds like a lot of reasons why they're running a lot of more hollow camshafts. Yes, yes. Great information, Cody. So next we've got a couple questions coming up to make sure that you understand these basic components of the variable valve timing system. Please answer the questions next.